welcome, 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 children, to season two, I guess, of Instagram Rants. No longer on Instagram. Gotta change the title. <clears throat> but today, what we're going to be discussing is a little bit of a, a bigger topic. I'm washed out. A little bit of a bigger topic. I know a lot of you kind of really like my second theory that like connected all the physical worlds and like a cycle but that was I don't know how to put this bad yeah bad this is a lot more than that what I have created today and well I've been trying to make this video for months I've made PowerPoint presentations and like I, I've played around with so many different types of trying to get this idea across but I think finally just kind of gonna let it flow from the heart and I've created my own scientific theorem, I guess, this sort of answer to life. Um, and I'm going to use it to scientifically prove that humanity is the worst. Let's get going, shall we? So, as kind of like a base concept, something you need to under you need to grasp to understand the rest of the entire theory. I've created a unit of measurement known as the hate particle. Now what a hate particle is, you can think of it as an imperceptible body that is comprised of pure hatred. And every single living being is filled with these hate particles, right? And this is where the hatred inside of them comes from. They are sort of vomiting their hate particles, or using their natural hate particles to vent their hatred out onto the world. This is a base concept that we will be uh, sort of building upon for the rest of the video. Okay, are you with me on this? Because if you're not with me now, it is only going to get more complicated from here on out. So you might be thinking, hate particles, right? Okay, I'm with you. How is it measured? Do you just have more hate particles and then you're a more hatred-filled person? No. It's not based on amount. It is based on hate density. The more hate particles per square inch that you have, the more hateful a person you are. Now, I say person, but this goes for every single living being in, we'll say, the universe. Um, so... How, what determines your hatred density? Now, we'll be operating on the assumption that all entities of a single species have the same hate density. It, in reality, it would fluctuate from being to being, but for the sake of the argument, it's pretty level. So we are going to ignore any individual variation in hate density in a species. Because generally speaking, as a species, most things have the same density. All right, so, so, how do we determine the base hate, hate particle density, the hate particles per square inch of a whole species? Well, let's take a step back because I need to talk a little bit about what I'm determining a species is. If I were to break down every single species in the animal kingdom, that would take a while, and it would just be, it would get super granular, and I'm trying to define an overall concept here. So we're going to alter the definition of what a species is for today's thought experiment. Now, I'm going to basically lump together similar creatures, um, all dogs and wolves, they'll go in to create the canids, you know, all types of cats, big and small, into like the felids, um, any insects, uh, they'll probably be up like by type, but generally pretty similar. Um, so yeah, we're gonna lump things, so lump some things together to simplify our process. Now, what determines the base for a species? Well, every being in a species has a base level, right? It alter, it, it changes a little bit, but it's a base level for every creature individually in the species. Now, by size, the hate density will naturally change. If it's a smaller 
thing in the species, that's a higher hate density. If it's larger, those hate particles have, have more room to spread out. And so if you look at like one square inch, there will be less hate particles in it than in a smaller uh, animal where it is more densely packed. And the more, generally speaking, the more densely packed animal will be, will be more hateful to its environment. It has a higher hate particle density. So, let's move on to a bit of an example to explain this part of the theorem. Oh, caffeine. Dogs, right? Everyone knows dogs are a very wide spectrum of animal. They have chihuahuas, which are very tiny, to like Newfoundland dogs, which are very big. So naturally, there is go this is going to be a great example to show the hate particle density variation in a species. You take a chihuahua, you see that it is very small. Now, it is still going to have the base canine uh, hate particle amount, right? Now, by canine, let's say well, it has like a density of 100 hate particles. There are a lot more, but like, we'll say 100 to simplify. This chihuahua, it's like a foot long, like half a foot tall, you know, it's small. It is going to have a very high density, and everyone knows chihuahuas are evil. They're little barky bastards, and everyone hates them. Now you take a Newfoundland. It's big. It's fluffy. It's about the size of me if I decided to go on all fours for any reason. Newfoundlands are very large. So, naturally, if it has the same hundred hate particles that are in a chihuahua this big, and now they're spread out over this level of a dog, it's going to have a much lower density. Does this make sense? It should, because Newfoundlands are very friendly. They're very friendly dogs. I should know. I had one. And yeah, they're very friendly. And it's because they have, if you took a one inch by one inch by one inch segment, you would not see very many hate particles in it. Right? That makes sense. It's dogs, people. It's dogs. So this same base concept is true for every species. I hope you're following. Because here is where we get a little bit more complicated. The law doesn't exactly... It's not that simple, you know? There are stipulations. Because we're trying to explain something as complicated as the animal kingdom. It's not going to be just two steps. So I'm going to... Let's see, what should I explain next? The fluff factor. When it was first discovered by Alfredo Fluffieri in 1649, the fluff principle stated that the more fluffy a creature is, the more friendly it will be. Because the base principle kind of... It worked on the assumption that when hate particles exit the body and they try to go through this deep fluff, they're going to have trouble kind of getting out through it. However, it's a little bit more complicated than that. But to explain it in its base form, as an example, well, so we'll provide an example. A chihuahua is the same size as a Pomeranian, correct? Correct. Which one is more friendly? The Pomeranian. It's more fluffy. The hate particles can't get out as easily. Uh, you take a Labrador and you take a Golden Retriever. Golden Retrievers are a little bit more friendly because it's a little bit more fluffy. Um, and this pattern continues, like, in, you see it in every species of dog, you know? But it's not that simple. See, this stipulation has sub-stipulations, and it's because of, well, a a alignment. Now, alignment is a concept popularized by Dungeons and Dragons. Um, basically, it's a person's moral kind of compass, I guess? Basically, it's dictated by a kind of a three by three square with a trait posted on each of the rows and columns. The traditional D&D alignment is lawful, neutral, chaotic, and good, neutral, and evil. 
other way around, but who cares? Because my principal is a little bit different. It doesn't use the exact same traits. It still uses lawful, neutral, and chaotic. But the uh, other terms are... They are... I definitely didn't have to just make them up. Friend, neutral, and bastard. So the alignments are as follows. Lawful friend, neutral friend, chaotic friend, lawful neutral, true neutral, chaotic neutral, and then lawful bastard, neutral bastard, and chaotic bastard. This is how we this is how we will be con This is how we will be segmenting the entire animal kingdom through these nine alignments. So what do the alignments have to do? with any of this. <laughs> the alignments dictate how the fluff vector actually affects your species. Now, with dogs, the dogs are lawful friend. Now, this means that the fluff factor works as it is originally stated. It blocks the hate particles from the world. But in other species that are uh, either chaotic or ba a bastard, then it works slightly differently. It actually amplifies it. So, I, I did a bad job of explaining this. If it's lawful, in this kind of area here, then, it's, then it has the traditional effect. It blocks the hate. If it's in this area over here, then it amplifies it. Now, I already talked about dogs and the fluff factor. But what about cats? Everyone knows that cats are on the exact opposite side of the spectrum. Cats are chaotic bastards. And this means that their fluffiness actually makes them more hateful. Everyone knows that... I'm saying everyone knows. <laughs> it's a well-known fact that hairless cats are actually quite nice. However, it's the fluffy cats you have to worry about. Think about it. All the fluffiest cats are the meanest, right? Like Persians, they're like always the villain cat. If you think of Blofeld in the James Bond movies, he has a Persian. Um, in Babe, I, 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 yeah, the movie Babe the Pig, I think Duchess is a Persian. Very fluffy cats, very evil. And if you're trying to find Persian cats that are good, I can argue, like, um, Crookshanks from the Harry Potter movies, very fluffy, very, it's still a cat, right? Wrong. Crookshanks is part measle, means the alignment is different. The fluff amplifies the hate factor. So, you know what? Okay, I can prove this. I submit to the court, subject A my own cat. Very fluffy, no? See, he's got a big, fluffy tail, and he's currently biting me. He is evil. He is a chaotic bastard. He's disturbing the recording. <laughs> he proves my point. He's very fluffy. The hate amplifies the fluff. One moment. All right, he's free. The f the fluff amplifies the hate. That's what I meant to say. All right. So, I think I've illustrated my point. We will, for all further examples, we will be placing them on this scale. Dogs are here. Cats are here. We'll move on. To create an example where we use both of these concepts in tandem, I will be examining bees and wasps, which fall under the species Stingy wingy insects. They sting, they got wings, they're insects. Stingy wingy insects. So, where do the stingy wingy insects lie? Well, I would say they are in lawful neutral. So, what does that mean for their fluff factor? A fluff on a stingy wingy insect would block the hate. It would stop the hate particles from coming out of them, making them less hateful to their environment. Right? Right. So, let's see where they lie. We have bees, different types of bees, and wasps. Now, 
Let's look at the bumblebee. A bumblebee, very spherical, very cylindrical, right? Because it's got a lot of fluff. It's a very fluffy, stingy, mingy insect. And we can see that at a base level of um, a base level of hate particles for this creature, then it would be less hateful. The hate blocks it. Then we look at wasps, another stingy wingy insect. They've got no fluff. They're very spindly. Their hate density is going to be very high. So naturally, wasps are very hateful, and everyone knows wasps are evil. This makes sense. It works. It just works. So, like, this sounds like a fairly complete theory, right? It sounds, like, finished. But that's where you're wrong. Because this is still not complex enough to describe the animal kingdom. Not everything is going to fit into this. So, what do we do? Well, we add another subsect. We, okay, so, I guess, I guess it's time to explain the Yage food chain. <laughs> So, the Yage food chain... God, these shoes hurt. They're too small. You know what? Costume change. That's better. The Yage food diagram. Now, what is Yage? Yage is spelled Y-A-W-Y-E, and it stands for You Are What You Eat. So the Yage food chain introduces an element of your diet affecting your hate particle count. So. What does, what, what, what effect does this have on our system? Okay, let's, let, let's lay this. The Yage food chain, it operates on the concept that we all learn in biology that um, <laughs> a consumer gets 10% of the energy of the food they eat. Um, so it's generally stated that the sun puts out energy, and as we all know, the sun consists of purely hate particles. It's 100% uh, made of hate particles. And then plants get about 10% of the energy from the sun. I don't know if that's right. But, uh, and everyone knows, plants are also very hateful. They get their energy directly from the hate particle source. And everyone knows plants are, they, they are filled with this primal hate towards their environment, which is why, um, yeah, they're, they're, they're very hateful. Um, however, they are on the lawful neutral, I'd say. Um, no, I, I, I'd say they're probably neutral friend. So, yeah, the plants are neutral friends, um, which means that the fuzzier a plant is, the, uh, more hate particles that are blocked, which is why moss is the friendliest plant. But generally speaking, plants are filled with a lot of hatred, which, like, they absolutely should be with how they're being treated right now, which is a whole other element that I won't go into very much in this video. But, okay, yeah, plants are very hateful. And then um, herbivores eat the plants. They get about 10% of that energy, and thereby 10% of the hate particles. And then predators eat the herbivores, and that and they get about 10% of that energy. So what I'm generally saying here is that hate particles are past from food source to food source to food source with diminishing returns. And um, so basically, what if what you eat is further along on this uh, chain, you are absorbing less hate particles. The closer you are to the source, which is the sun, um, then you are getting more hate particles, which is why you should never eat the sun. You will instantly implode. This is the reason why you should not eat the sun. Okay, let's implement this. So, I've already stated that plants are very hateful because of how close they how they get their energy from the sun. Uh, but I'll move on to talking about the herbivores. Um, herbivores, they are also getting a lot of hate particles in their diet. So... Um, yeah, I'll, I'll examine that. You ever hear of a raging bull? Ever wonder why it's so angry? It's because all, all it's eating is grass. Grass has a terrible fluff rating because it's just one spike. And it, so, so the bull gets a ton of hate particles because the grass puts out so much of it. And then 
it goes into the stadium, and it's like, ah, you stabbed me, I'm gonna kill you, because obviously they would, why are you, why are you stabbing them? Okay. And then, that means that predators, predators, have you ever seen a lion? As long as it's not, you know, like, in a circus and getting treated super horribly, lions are pretty chill. You ever seen them out on the savannah? They're, like, pretty chill, and that's because they're eating, like, antelopes. Antelopes are getting about 10% of the hate particles from the plants, so they've got some hate, but they're only getting, like, the, 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 the lions are getting 10% of that, so the lions are not getting a lot of hate particles, and lions are super chill. That's why they have, like, a pretty matriarchal society, I think. I may be wrong. I may be thinking of a different animal. But anyway, so the, yeah, predators are chill. Herbivores, a little bit angry. They, they can get excitable. Which, like, okay. Predi the, the herbivores also absolutely deserve to be angry. And so do the plants, and the sun is just pure hate particles. So the predators, ch chill, deserved anger, deserved anger, sun. This is the Yaye food chain. You are what you eat. You ingest the hate particles from the things you eat. Okay, I, I think I've illustrated this. Now, I mentioned, uh, like, just really quickly, uh, about, like, how you're treated affecting hate particle production. Um, but it's really not that much. Um, it more focuses on how you let loose the hate particles. It, it's like a bigger flow into your outside world. Uh, so it's like a base level. And then obviously plants are treated horribly. Herbivores are treated horribly. So they are able to put out more. But they still have the same density that we can do in our calculations. Right? Makes sense. Okay. So... This is, that's about as far as I'll go into it uh, for today, um, but l let's see how all of these work, like, in tandem. Alexa, tell me an animal. Here is an animal, the gastrofruiting frog. Frogs. Wonderful. Okay, amphibians, they are, uh, they are neutral friends about on the same grass level. They're treated very well, um, but they don't have any fluff. Which means every, uh, every frog, like Alexa told me so nicely, uh, and other amphibians like salamanders and axolotls, I think, what have you, it's, um, amphibians are very hateful. But I, this hate, they're not generally treated very bad anywhere besides, like, I don't know, France. Um, so generally, they don't have... They don't put out a lot of hate particles, which is why every frog deep inside of them has this well of hate that if you push them, they're going to let out. So don't push a frog. Alexa, tell me an animal. Here is an animal, the northern elephant seal. Elephant seal. Okay, elephant seals, we'll just lump them all into seals. Seals treated pretty poorly. They were clubbed for a long time and probably still are. I don't know. Um, but... Seals are chaotic friends, uh, they, which means that the fluff factor doesn't play into it very much because it's both chaotic and um, a friend, which those two kind of like cancel out. So I would say they're pretty neutral on like the, the hate particle scale, but they are treated very badly, which means you should be careful around seals. Alexa, tell me an animal. Find one. Here is an animal. Pterosaur. Pterosaur. Ooh, dinosaurs. I didn't think I'd have to bring dinosaurs into this. Dinosaurs. Very large. Which means their density is not going to be very uh, high. They're pretty small uh, as a species. Um, but, so, pterosaurs are very big. They are definitely chaotic. Okay, I, I think they're probably like chaotic neutral. Pterosaurs are chaotic neutral. Actually, wait. Oh, no. Oh, no. I'm going to disappoint... 13-year-old me so much. I was thinking of Tyrannosaur. Pterosaurs can fly. Pterosaurs. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Not as big as dinosaurs, uh, but they are chaotic bastard now. So um, they're going to have a higher density, and they're not very fluffy. Uh, even if it was fluff, it's just feathers. Um, but I don't even think they had that many feathers. I don't know. I don't know shit about dinosaurs, y'all. Okay. But... So they're here. They're pretty small, unless you're counting the Hetzogopteryx. They're pretty small. So, I mean... 
yeah, pterosaurs, they have about a mid-level, but, like, you know, just be careful. I, I think they were treated pretty well, but, like, I wouldn't want to keep one as a pet, you know? I think, I think it's got some hate in there, and, you know, it's obviously it's got the most chaotic rating, which is about the same as a cat. It's just a cat you wouldn't let in your house. Ugh. So now I get to the point of the video. Caffeine. That's not the point of the video. I wanted to scientifically prove where humanity fits on this scale. But, um... Well, it doesn't exact... Like, I have to just... Mm, like some... Mm. Okay. It's a little bit more complicated with humans. You see... Well, it's because... Mm, it's because of Ayn Rand. Alright. Ayn Rand, in her essay, The Objectivist Ethics, uh, sort of builds up the concept of consciousness. Um, what she says is that, like, the base levels of consciousness, like, things like amoebas or, I don't know, like, sea cucumbers, these, these like, base levels of consciousness, they act on senses. They know pleasure or pain. They, and they act to that stimulus accordingly, run away or keep doing it. So it's this sort of base level of consciousness, and that builds up to, with more complicated creatures like the animals we've been discussing, um, the idea of percepts. Percepts are combinations of senses that help them understand their environment and make choices based on it. Uh, but it's still kind of a base level of consciousness. Humans exist above that on the level of concepts. Concepts are uh, multiple percepts working in tandem, so uh, it's a more con it's conceptual. It's this like formation of ideas, and you're able to react to them on your own. Um, and this complicates things because she also uh, posits that humans have a more like willing sense of doing it. We have the option to not be conscious on our full level. Um, while animals cannot choose whether or not to process these percepts, we can choose whether or not to form concepts, and which means that humanity can literally just be not fully sentient to our best, the best of our ability. And like Ayn Rand goes on to posit some more like problematic things, like how criminals act on a subhuman level, and instead of like this this upright moral oil executive who got his money by perfectly moral means, is like okay, Ayn, you can just stop. Anyway, but this brings into the idea that humans are somehow different in how they form ideas and how they can react to this system of hate particles. Me and Ayn Rand working together. So. What does this mean for our theory? What does this mean for the concept of the hate particle and alignment and fluff factor? Well, humans are very diverse, you know? Well, you see, we're so different that we can't, like, we can't act on stuff like size. We can't act on alignment because every human is so individual. We have surpassed this, uh, like, base animal way of taking in the world, this lack of choice. We are volitional in our consciousness. So, this means... We scrap the whole theory. We don't have an alignment anymore. We don't have to worry about size, but hate particles still work here. We have stops using hate particles as these, like, base level of, like, measurement. We've turned our hate particles into hate tokens because we are the most communica communicative species on this planet. We are inherently different than these other, like, animal societies. Like, you're, I'm gonna get someone who comments and is like, oh, but what about bugs? They have a social structure. No, it's different because they still act on percepts. Okay, all right. <sighs> society. It's society. We live in a society. And that's what, that's what separates us. I, I, other, I know that other creatures have social structures, 
but humans are inherently different because of our society, and it's we've literally changed how we process the hate particle. It's a hate token now, because we have these complex, complex interactions with other beings, these transactions, and... And why does this matter? Because we can now exchange hate particles, right? It's, it's different now. We can give our hate particles to other people. People can take the hate particles and use them for their own... In an in internet age, it is only increasing. Hate particles have become like a, like a currency. And, okay, you may say that, like, oh, if we are trading, shouldn't it all be equal? But no, because of the Pareto Principle! <laughs> the Pareto Principle is not something I made up. The Pareto Principle states, uh, it's it basically, it dictates a pattern of the 20% to 80% 20 to split. Um, the Pareto Principle uh, was created by, I believe, some guy named Pareto. I don't know. Uh, it, but it states that generally... 80% will have 20%, and 20% will have 80%. That doesn't make any sense, but it makes sense when I use it in examples. Basically, he observed that, like, in his garden, 20% of the pea pods had 80% of the peas. Um, it's generally a stated rule that in a home, eight, like, 20% of the carpet will get 80% of the wear. And it's because of the formation of, like, patterns in like where in ways that you walk and something that's already has something is bound to get more you know because of the way furniture is placed and it's seen everywhere it is seen in a ridiculous amount of places like think the u.s economy 20 percent of the people have 80 percent of the money it's this is how it works and so this will naturally come up in i'm not pointing at anything anymore it'll naturally come up in the concept of hate particles, right? With this now, this, like, trading of hate particles, this, uh, uh, hate tokens now, like, naturally, some people will have more hate particles. And these, the hate particles transfer in a very natural way in most interactions, but they happen most in transactions, which is why people who are rich... How's this video about again? All right, proving that humans are evil. Um... Man. So, to sum up the last couple of minutes, humanity as a species destroyed the concept of, well, this entire theorem, but we do just, we don't destroy it per se, we don't, we are, we still operate under its laws, we've just transformed it a bit. So, our natural social structure has turned hate particles into hate tokens that are now, like, communicated and transferred between people through interactions and transactions. And, well, what does this mean? Why, how does this prove that humanity is evil? If you'll please ignore that this has turned into basically an intro to ethics course. <sighs> Human beings have ruined this theorem. And that is why all human beings are the worst. Because they cannot be processed. I say this when, really, you all knew it going in. It is foolish to try to calculate the worth of an entire species, but still, it feels like you should be able to, right? You should be able to figure out these things. And not because everything must make sense, but everything must follow a pattern, right? Well, humanity may not do that. If it is impossible to, even by a made-up set of rules, calculate how bad or good someone is going to be, that makes... <sighs> Do I really have to bring in Nietzsche? It's a common thread in both nihilism and... You know what, I feel overdressed now. Costume change. A common thread 
in both nihilism and stoicism is this concept of premeditatio malorum, if you'll excuse my terrible Latin. And basically, it dictates this sort of natural human urge to constantly prepare for the worst. Uh, granted, they're actually advocating for it, but it kind of generally, it focuses on this human urge to constantly fear for something bad that's going to happen, and this extends to how we think of our fellow man. We constantly prepare for the worst action they could do, We're constantly feeling like they want to betray us. We're in fear of it, really. And this means that there's a human, a natural urge that follows of wanting to understand everyone's base urges, that every, like, wanting to be able to conceptualize human behavior and whether this person is good or not. But you can't. The thing is, that's why humans are the worst. It's because they cannot be quantified. Why did I say they? I'm a human too, I hope. Anyway, yeah, this got really wild at a couple points, but I'm sorry. <laughs> and this ended on the floor.